Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to continue with microeconomics, looking at government intervention in the form of price controls. Um, price control is the government uh, setting a price above or below the free market equilibrium. We're going to first look at a price ceiling, and an example of price ceilings are rent controls. Uh, New York City is a classic example in economics. Um, here we can see in Wikipedia, New York's current rent control program, which began in 1943, is the longest running in the United States. This uh, uh, idea of rent controls began in 1942 with Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, we were getting to a point of full employment during the wartime economy. And there was a fear that increasing demand because of full employment would lead to rising rents, thus the need for price controls. Uh, later on in class, we will look at a current contemporary issue that is working homelessness in the United States, looking at, um, in this case, Californians who are homeless but working part or full time, which is actually sad to consider that people are, are working and not, even, not able to afford the necessity of housing. Um, some of the statistics presented within this article states that in 2017, homeless populations in San Francisco found that 13% of the respondents were part or full time. They were homeless or working part or full time. Los Angeles County, which has um, more than 50,000 residents who are homeless, 8% of the adults surveyed said they were working to some degree, mostly in part-time, seasonal, or temporary work. So even though that these people are working part or full-time, they're not able to afford uh, rent. So for example, here we have a person making $17 an hour, right, which is above the minimum wage. But when we look at the median rent for a two-bedroom, it's at about $1,752 per month which would claim, in this case, half of her income, right? More than 50% of her income just going to the necessity of rent. So when looking at an issue such as working homelessness, there are a variety of solutions that can be applied, and they have their pros and their cons. Let's take into uh, account rent control. So let's go ahead and graph this, right? So here we have our... Uh, our, uh, our graph. We're measuring quantity of affordable housing on the x-axis, the price of that affordable housing on the y-axis. We're looking at the market for affordable housing, let's say in the city of New York, and we will illustrate the supply of housing, which is upward sloping, and we will illustrate the demand for affordable housing that is downward sloping. So let's go ahead and label that. So we have supply of housing, and we're going to remember that's equal to our marginal costs of production. And we have the demand for housing, which is equal to demand, which is equal to the marginal benefit of consuming that affordable housing. The free market, as we've learned before, provides an equilibrium price and quantity, where S1 equals D1, which is at this point. So let's go ahead and establish that free market equilibrium. The free market equilibrium price at price equilibrium and the free market equilibrium quantity at quantity equilibrium. Okay. Now in economics, this is what we, we desire to allow the free market to gravitate towards that equilibrium. And when we achieve this, we see that both consumer and producer surplus are at maximum, thus it is allocatively efficient. All right, so this is point A, and at point A, MC equals MB, so it's allocatively efficient. And we can highlight how the consumer and producer surplus, oh, let me get rid of that, use a different color. So for consumer surplus, let's just go ahead and use green. That's fine. We're going to see that this triangular area represents the maximized consumer surplus. And I'll just make a note here. 
Uh, this is our consumer surplus. I have a previous video illustrating consumer and producer surplus, but we're just going to highlight this again. So in the free market, consumer surplus is at maximum. Uh, those that are willing to pay a high price are getting a rental apartment at this particular price. So this is their level of savings. Other people might be willing to pay this much for affordable housing, but they're actually paying this price. So this is the level of their savings. And we have one, you know, perhaps a few people willing to pay this particular amount and they're getting rental apartment at that amount. So they don't have any savings, but they're getting um, that amount. And then those who are willing to pay a lower price don't get the affordable housing because the uh, market prices is, is higher. So those who are willing and able to buy uh, or rent housing are able to get it along this demand curve up to point A. In terms of uh, producer surplus, those who are providing housing, we see that producer surplus is also being maximized. This is the level of maybe, uh, you could say that the profit margin uh, to an extent of the suppliers of housing, that red area. So this is the producer surplus, oops. And here we see that we have someone willing to uh, provide their housing at this particular price, but they're renting it at a much higher price, so that's kind of like their, their profit. Another uh, provider of housing might be willing to provide at this point, but they're uh, providing it at a higher price, so that's the level of their profit. Remember that the supply curve is their costs, their marginal cost of providing housing. So the consumer and producer surplus in the free market is at maximum, and that's what we desire. The free market, in this case, all right, provides an equilibrium price at PE, an equilibrium quantity at QE, and we're going to remember that at QE, the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded. And we're also going to note that at point A, where S1 equals D1, we also have marginal cost equaling uh, marginal benefit. Thus, it is allocatively efficient because both consumer and producer surplus is at maximum. All right, social surplus, which is the sum of consumer and producer surplus, is at maximum. All right, but we're going to see that with price controls, uh, that is distorted. We're out of equilibrium, and we're not maximizing either our producer or consumer surplus. Okay, so let's go ahead and illustrate a price control, an example of a price control. Price control being a minimum or maximum price set by the government or private organization so that prices are unable to adjust to their free market equilibrium. And we're looking at the example of a price ceiling, that the price cannot be above the ceiling set, in this case, by the uh, government. We're looking at the market for affordable housing in New York City. So we're gonna illustrate an upward sloping supply curve. Supply being equal to our marginal costs of production. And then we have our downward sloping demand curve. Demand being equal to our marginal benefit. Okay, we wanna remember that in this particular market, even though the supply and demand curves are not illustrated as such, that the supply curve is inelastic. The PES, the price elasticity of supply, is less than one for housing due to length of time. It takes time to build more affordable housing. And the demand curve, because housing is a necessity, also is inelastic. So the PED is also less than one. So keep that in mind. Let's illustrate the free market equilibriums. So the free market equilibrium is right here. Price at equilibrium in the free market and the equilibrium quantity is right here. Quantity uh, in the free market. The government decides that the free market equilibrium price of PE is too high. 
for affordable housing. So they step in and they set a maximum, a maximum price or a price ceiling set below the free market equilibrium price so that it is binding. So here we have our price ceiling. I'll label that PC for price ceiling. And we see that due to the lower price, the quantity demanded increases. We see that it's an increase in the quantity demanded due to that lower price in accordance to the law of demand. And we see that the quantity demand has increased. So I'll label that QD, quantity of demand. But for providers of affordable housing, they're not incentivized to provide their housing because their costs of production or their cost of providing affordable housing is greater than the price ceiling. So they're going to take their affordable housing units, apartment units, off the market. All right, there's no incentive there. They're not going to earn profit. They're actually going to lose money. So the quantity supply decreases from QE to, we'll call this QS, quantity supply. Now, this is important. This is typically what we see by a binding. And when I mean binding, that the price ceiling is set below the free market price. If it was set above the free market price, we would call that a non-binding um, price ceiling. But we'll, since it is below the free market, it's a binding price ceiling. And in theory and in reality, what we see is a shortage being created. Price ceilings typically lead to a shortage. Why? Because at a price of PC, at that price, we see that the quantity being demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. So we have excess demand. And the government, through that price ceiling, is not allowing for the market to go back to equilibrium where at PE and at QE, quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. So the economy is out of equilibrium. There, this particular market is in disequilibrium, okay? So where is the uh, economy operating at? It's operating at QS, right? This market is operating at QS because that's the quantity of housing being supplied. So let's further draw this line up, right, to this point. So those that are willing and able to pay for affordable rent, I'm willing to pay maybe $100, I'm actually paying 20 per month, I'm willing to pay 80, I'm actually paying 20. These people here, these consumers are getting more affordable housing. So they're better off. So let's um, label some areas just to help us with our analysis. We'll call this area A and we'll call this area B. Area C, area D, and area E. In addition, it could also help us to illustrate three sections of the consumers. So I'm just going to illustrate a line representing three sections of consumers. All right, this is kind of one section here. This line's coming up to this section here. And here we have another section over there. So from section, from this point to this point, let's call that section one, call this section two, and over here is section three. So we can begin to evaluate the impact of this price ceiling on stakeholders. The first stakeholder that we're gonna look at is the consumer. All right, consumers in section one, we're gonna divide the consumers into three sections, as we said. So here's our demand curve. Let's look at consumers in section one. They are better off, all right? Why? Because they are able to get affordable housing at a lower price. Before they were paying PE, but now the price has fallen to PC, and thus their consumer surplus has increased. More savings for them. Consumer surplus has risen, right? Before their consumer surplus was areas 
A plus B, all right, this triangular area here. Now it is A plus C. So we're going to state that A plus C is greater than A plus B. So they get this consumer surplus area here, which we'll illustrate just so we can visually see that increase in the consumer surplus. Okay, so they are better off. How about those in section two and in section three? Well, they are facing the shortage. Consumers in sections two and three are facing a shortage and they might have to refer, revert to a parallel market or an underground market. Perhaps in the underground market, they might find uh, some landlords willing to provide their housing illegally above the price ceiling, and they might be making deals with consumers willing to operate in the underground market to acquire rental housing at a higher uh, price, a price that's higher than the legal maximum. So perhaps consumers in section two representing consumer surplus of area B, get some housing and landlords uh, here provide that housing in section, uh, section D. Um, but they're operating in the parallel market or the black market or the underground market. So consumers might be experiencing non-price rationing issues such as favoritism, first come first serve, discrimination, et cetera. Consumers in section three are just worse off. They would, they're willing to get housing, but they just can't find it. They're, they just, they don't get anything. How about the producers? Producers are worse off because they only get section E. So let's go ahead and illustrate that real quick. Their consumer surplus has been reduced. Before it was C, B, uh, C, D, and E, and it's been reduced to area E. So this is ultimately what we would be drawing to illustrate a price control or a price ceiling. And now we can begin to analyze and evaluate it. So let's go ahead and take some notes. So as can be seen, we have a market for affordable housing with quantity being measured on the x-axis and price being measured on the y-axis. We have an upward sloping supply curve labeled S1, which is equal to our marginal costs of providing affordable housing for landlords. And we have a downward sloping demand curve in accordance to the law of demand, which is equal to the marginal benefit. Where S1 equals D1, right? Where S1 equals D1, it provides an equilibrium price at PE and equilibrium quantity at QE, where at QE, the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded. And we have uh, a free market equilibrium where the consumer surplus is at maximum. It's equals to areas A plus B. And the producer surplus is also at maximum. And it's equal to areas C, D, and E. C plus D plus E. Okay? Then the government decides to intervene and they set a price ceiling below the free market equilibrium price. So the price ceiling lowers the price. From PE, it goes down to PC. As a result of the lower price at PC, we see that the quantity demanded increases from QE to QD. And we see that the quantity supplied by landlords falls from Q, I'm sorry, QE to QS. So at a price of PC, at a price of PC, we see that the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. Excess demand or a shortage has just been created. So the economy or the market is out of equilibrium. Okay, so PC creates disequilibrium. Supply and demand are not allowed to intersect with each other. Quantity demanded is greater than quantity supplied. So let's take a, a few more notes on its impact on stakeholders. All right, so that's kind of our analysis, just explaining the impact 
of the price ceiling. Now let's evaluate the impact on stakeholders. Evaluation on stakeholders. Okay, first let's look at consumers. Number one, consumers of affordable housing. We're going to look at three sections of consumers along our demand curve. Let's look at consumers in section one. They are better off. Why? Because price has fallen from PE to PC. They're paying a lower price and their consumer surplus has increased. It's gone up. Before it was A plus B, now it's A plus C, which is greater. So they are better off. I'll put a little smiley face that they love the price control. Consumers in section two are not so satisfied. All right, consumers in section two along our demand curve are worse off. They face a shortage. They're looking at a shortage of housing. And they might have to resort, they might have to resort to the uh, underground market or the black market or the parallel market. And if they resort to the underground market, if they try to make deals with landlords where they're paying uh, a higher price for rental prices, they might be facing what we call uh, non-price rationing. Since there are no legal controls in this underground market, uh, consumers might uh, experience favoritism. Landlords preferring perhaps one type of group over another, which might be illegal. That might be aspects of um, uh, racial prejudice, um, etc. They might experience um, oh, first come, first serve, waiting in line, uh, kind of first come, first serve. All right, and other non-price non rationing issues. So consumers in section two, all right, they are worse off. How about consumers in section three? Again, they are worse off because they get nothing. They cannot find any housing. Even though they're demanding it, there's no uh, quantity being supplied to satisfy them. So sections two and section three are worse off. Section two, they might find housing in the uh, parallel market, but in section three, consumers will find absolutely no housing, so they're worse off. How about producers? All right, producers, number two, another stakeholder. Producers are worse off. Why? Because the price that they can charge falls. Price falls for them from PE to PC. That reduces their producer surplus. So producer surplus goes down. All right, it goes from C plus D plus E, and it goes down to just area E. So they're clearly worse off. What about their total revenue? Total revenue one before was PE times QE. And then after total revenue two is PC times QS. So it's a smaller total revenue area. So total revenue two is less than total revenue one. So again, they are worse off. So producers don't benefit. Other stakeholders that we can mention. We can also take into account um, workers. Number three, workers. And this is these are workers that are part of the provision of affordable housing. Workers that work within the uh, provision. They're on the supply side. They're part of the cost of production, the provision of affordable 
housing. So perhaps these are landlords hiring workers for maintenance, landlords hiring workers to paint um, and refurbish apartments, landlords hiring workers uh, to help them rent their apartment, like real estate agents, etc. They will experience a decrease in the quantity of demand, so they might be they will be fired. So workers, as a result, all right, as a result of the quantity demanded legally falling, right, from QE to QS, legally, the quantity of demand legally is decreasing, right? It's only section one that's getting the housing. So the quantity of demand decreasing from QE to QS, as a result of the quantity supplied also decreasing from QE to QS, Uh, due to the quantity supply decreasing, landlords they begin to fire excess resources like labor. So less employment in this particular market on the supply side. So workers are worse off. How about the government? Last one. The government may benefit or lose. The government benefits because they will get support from consumers in section one along the demand curve. But they will not benefit in terms of political support because they will lose support from consumers in sections two and three. And they will also lose support from producers. This is political support. All right. I will provide these notes in um, the information section of the video. All right, so that's our evaluation. Evaluating consumers in section one, they benefit, they get more consumer surplus areas A, plus C greater than areas A plus B. Consumers in section two and six and section three are worse off. Section two consumers might have to resort to the parallel market where they'll face non-price rationing. Uh, and consumers in section three will get nothing. They will not find any affordable housing. So consumers in section one may support the uh, price control by the government and support the government, but consumers in section two and section three will not support the price control because they are not benefiting from it. Producers are worse off and they will also not support the government. The producers had a producer surplus of area C plus D plus E, then it's been decreased to area E. Um, and their total revenue is also decreased from PE times QE to PC times QS. So they are worse off. Um, and as a result of the decrease in the quantity supply due to the decrease in the quantity demanded in the legal market, the decrease in quantity supplied from QE to QS results in increased unemployment within the market for the provision of affordable housing. Less real estate agents being demanded, less contractors and um, uh, other individuals that maintain property being demanded by the landlords. And also a part of our evaluation, we, also, we need to discuss the impact on allocative efficiency. All right. Uh, at QS, at the quantity supplied of housing in the legal market, at QS, we notice that the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. At QS, we notice that the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, which is an under allocation. an under allocation of resources to the provision of affordable housing versus what is desired by society versus what 
is desired by society. Society would like more affordable housing being provided, uh, but it's not as a result of the price control so, or the price ceiling. So since MB is greater than MC, a welfare loss is created, right? which is equal to areas B plus D. Society loses the increased quantity being supplied by landlords and the increased consumption by households. So that is the welfare loss, which we can also illustrate. It is this triangular area here, which we see, all right? Allocative efficiency, another important point of regarding our evaluation. So we have analyzed, we have drawn, analyzed, and evaluated a price ceiling in the market for affordable housing. If you have any questions, feel free to comment, and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.